Check, check. Audio. Okay. I can't, I think I can be heard now. Uh, sorry about that, everybody. Uh, technical issues as often comes up with things like this. Once again, welcome to another live stream of the Angry Astronaut. Um, a couple of quick comments that I would like to make before we get started. First of all, for my viewers and indeed for anybody else who is currently trapped um, in the Gulf states, uh, especially in Louisiana, um, Mississippi, et cetera, the areas that are currently being uh, affected by the hurricane, um, that is, uh, it's an awful thing from what it seems to be developing. It is my hope that this storm is not as devastating as they are predicting. Um, however, you know, having seen some of the damage that was done by Katrina way back, um this is uh this is uh some some frightening stuff so i hope things um go better than what we are thinking as far as that storm is concerned and for um the uh, service members for all the nato soldiers who are currently in afghanistan right now um helping with an errand of mercy um in spite of the fact that there are evil men who have uh, sabotaged a lot of what they've done and killed um some of these brave people um uh, my uh, deepest regards to these people as well um and thank you for doing what you are doing so and that goes to, to for all the nato soldiers who are currently in kabul um or have served there so okay enough of that um so let's move on. Uh, the reason I came up with this idea is sort of related to the uh, to the video that I just made about Virgin Orbit. Virgin Orbit and companies like them, actually lots of startups right now, are basing their philosophy on a pretty accurate notion that space is going smaller, not bigger, right? You've got, um, you know, small sats, micro sats, et cetera, that can do a great deal of what larger satellites used to do. And indeed, um, the large percentage, the vast majority of satellites that are being deployed right now, uh, if you take Starlink out of the equation anyway, if you, if it, aside from Starlink, almost all of these satellites have been small sats lately. Very few of the satellites deployed are traditional satellites because they don't have to be. Um, so that, you know, that is the question here. Um, you know, Starship obviously has utility when it comes to Mars. I mean, that's really what it was designed for, right? To take huge numbers of people, large amounts of cargo to the red planet in order to establish a colony there. The question is going to be, of course, you know, is that going to make anybody any money or is this just something that Elon Musk has in his own, you know, in his own private uh, legacy that he's establishing for himself to save the human race, to make us into a multi-planetary civilization, which I thoroughly support. But aside from Mars, what are we looking at right now? Because do we really need 100 tons to LEO? What, you know, are there enough customers to to you know to accommodate that there's starlink of course and starship can deploy tons and tons of starlinks that's that's true but how much longer is that going to go on how many more starlink satellites are going to be deployed before some regulatory agency puts the brakes on them and says okay we've got enough satellites up there right now because we've got one web we have so many other constellations that sat revolution um, that's being put up by virgin orbit etc you've got all these different uh, companies that are deploying all of these satellite constellations so how many more sat starlink satellites are going to be deployed before somebody slows it down so you know that all being the case yes somebody just suggested asteroid mining i love the idea there um i think that that starship is probably the only vessel that's going to be able to practically do that the question is going to be are we going to you know convince uh any investors that this is going to be a worthwhile thing because obviously the whole 
the front end cost of asteroid mining is colossal. It's not just Starship, it's all the massive amounts of equipment, a lot of it automated equipment, et cetera, you know, that sort of thing. Now, of course, we have Artemis um, and we have the idea of colonizing the moon, but you're going to need more than just Starship in order to colonize the moon in earnest. You're going to need, you know, a lot of other companies and organizations building sizable habitats. I mean, we're not talking about little habitats here. If you're deploying little habitats, you can use smaller landers. You don't need Starship for, for you know, smaller habitats. You need Starship for colossal habitats that are going to house dozens of people. And so, you know, that being the case, uh, you know, who's going to get behind that if, you know, I mean, SpaceX will, sure, but SpaceX can't do all this stuff by themselves. They're going to need somebody else to really buy into this whole idea. And right now, the vast majority of space-related companies are going smaller, not bigger, right? They're going towards small sats, and that's how they're making their money, not, you know, not the other way around. Um, and yeah, Starlink, the whole idea is, you know, 30 something thousand satellites or, you know, something will eventually be deployed there. I have some strong doubts that the FAA is going to allow that. I think they're going to put the brakes on to Starlink at some point, maybe in the five to 10,000 satellite range, something like that. They're eventually going to say, okay, you've got enough up there you know, and it's getting too crowded, a little too risky. Not to say that Starlink itself is dangerous. It's um, it's the fact that there's so much other stuff and the more satellites you put up, the more the chance is that something could collide with it and create a bunch of, you know, space junk. And yeah, we know where the big stuff is, but the golf ball size stuff that could easily take out um, a Starlink satellite, you know, that could be bad news. Now, one thing I was thinking was also um, cleanup of low Earth orbit. By the way, Chris uh, Kakis, I really do appreciate it. And a really quick, uh, really quick note I just want to make to everybody. Thanks so much for the support I've been getting lately, both Super Chats um, and, uh, and PayPal during the donations right now. Um, it's, it's been incredibly helpful to me. So thank you very much, uh, for all that. Okay. So, um, vertical landing abilities, uh, <laughs> right. I love you, uh, 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 Jeff. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that is the, uh, that is the, the main thing. Um, you know, are is the rest of the world going to get behind a uh, you know a hundred tons to LEO? Are there going to be enough customers that are going to accommodate that? Um, Mel, I appreciate the question. I'm doing better. Um, I'm I'm trying to avoid too much discussion about my medical condition because this show isn't about me. It's about space. Um, but thank you. I appreciate your concern. Um, so I, all I can say is I'm, I, I, I think I'm getting somewhat better. Okay. Um, yeah. So, you know, as far as, you know, that is the big question though. I mean, who are the big players out there that are going to make use of, of a hundred tons to LEO? You know, what companies are, are there out there that are going to say, you know, yeah, we could really use 100 tons to LEO. I think Axiom Space might be one example of that eventually. I mean, right now, you know, they, their, um, their modules for their private space station can easily be deployed by Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. They don't need um, 100 tons to LEO in order to be able to deploy that, that, that uh, um, deploy their station, um, Sierra Nevada Corporation, and their idea, their inflatable modules for a very sizable space station that they intend to put up, um, that those inflatable modules can easily be accommodated in the fairing of Falcon Heavy or in the fairing of Vulcan, assuming it ever flies, um, that sort of thing. So, you know, even their plans you know, they, I think they want to build big space stations, but they have plans, you know, it, it costs tons of money to make the modules, 
for space stations in the first place. You got to make all those things on the ground at the cost of billions of dollars before you deploy them into space. And, you know, the, the question is, is this the sort of thing that Starship is going to work towards? Are, is anybody going to be able to manufacture 100 tons worth of payload even per year in the space station components to take advantage of Starship, let alone 100 tons a month or 100 tons a week or something like that, the way we're looking at it? You know, does Starship, I guess the big question is, does Starship have a realistic utility aside from Mars. I mean, you know, Mars is the big thing, and that is indeed what it was designed for. Um, it's one of the reasons why I'm wearing this shirt um, is because of that whole idea. But, you know, there's a lot of things that Starship could be used for, but we need companies to be investing in the ideas. We need companies to be interested in this sort of stuff. If we want to build a colossal space station in orbit that could, you know, house hundreds or thousands of people, if we want to build giant moon bases that house hundreds or thousands of moon miners and that sort of thing, you know, then we need, you know, a, a corporate environment, a commercial environment, and really a philosophy in our society that supports this kind of thing. And right now, sadly, I don't see it. I don't see anybody else that's really interested in putting lots and lots and lots of stuff into space um, un unless they're a smaller company with no money. Um, you know, they, they may have an ambition on something like the, the, the asteroid mining companies. There are asteroid mining companies that actually have selected Starship as their, you know, preferred uh, method of transporting their, their you know, their uh, mining ships, their asteroid mining ships out, that the Starship is the only thing that makes sense for them. Yeah, those guys, you know, have the right idea. Do they have any funds? No, they don't. They really don't. Um, there's no big investors that want to get behind this, and it's kind of frustrating. Joshua, thank you. Folks will start putting less effort into lightning satellites. It'll dramatically reduce satellite production costs and problems, says Joshua. Thank you. Appreciate the, uh, the five pounds and the comment. By the way, um, once again, my broadcast is going to be a little short, a little truncated today, um, simply because, um, number one, I'm still not at 100%. Number two, my son is actually here. Um, it's a holiday weekend, and I'm going to be spending some time um, with him. So um, at those who are familiar with my channel, they know, you know, you guys know the way I am. Family comes first. Um, Varda, they expect space manufacturing to be a trillion dollar industry. Very interesting. I want to check out Varda. Michael, thank you for putting that, especially in big block caps that way, uh, to draw my attention. Um, I'd really be interested. You know, I seem to remember actually researching something about Varda some time ago. So um, I'm, I'm very interested indeed uh, in, in Varda. So yeah. Um, we'll see how that works. No one is going to live on the moon, says Douglas. 11% gravity. Yeah, I agree. Living on the moon is impractical. I can't see, even though there's been some very interesting stories written about that concept. People who just live on the moon get a, you know, are born on the moon get a comp, you know, accustomed to the idea of living there because they can't go to Earth, right? Their bodies can't stand the G forces, but they just like the idea of living on the moon, they identify with with living there, you know, that sort of thing. Could could that ever happen to us, uh, you know, in our own psyche? Could we ever get accustomed to that idea that I like the moon, you know, and I don't ever want to, you know, see an ocean in person in my whole life or any, I don't know, I, I can't imagine that any human being would really want that, but you never know. I would say, you know, short-term um, mining jobs, that sort of thing, stay on the moon maybe for a year at a stretch, come back to Earth, maybe go back in five years, that sort of thing. Stephen, by the way, thank you very much uh, for the super chat. Um, these, these things are really, really helpful to me, so do very much appreciate it. Starship will never cost two million. Um, just saw that little remark there. I 
I tend to agree. I think two million is is really really optimistic. Maybe one day, like you know, 30, 40 years from now, but Starship will never make its money back, its investment money, because a lot of money is being spent on this thing, billions. And if you're only charging $2 million a flight, you're, it's going to take you forever to get your investment back. So I would say that, you know, and plus you can get away with charging $50 million or even $100 million per flight with Starship, um, you know, if considering its payload capabilities. Once again, assuming that there are, you know, those payloads are available. One thing that I've, I've noticed a lot of, the ISS, um, you know, these, these shipments that go up to the ISS, they never actually push the theoretical cargo capacities of the vessels in question. You send up a the recent Dragon capsule that went up to the ISS just, you know, just a, I think it was less than 24 hours ago, actually. I've tried to keep things straight in my head time-wise. But anyway, um, that capsule did not carry up anywhere near the maximum capacity of a, uh, of a Dragon uh, cargo ship, not even close. And so, you know, my question is, uh, you know, where, why is that? Why is there not much of a need for, um, for more cargo going up to the ISS? Gotcha. So one that's just been explained to me, ASN, my my partner in crime here in Yorkshire, explained to me that uh, that part of the dragon is being used for laboratory purposes. So yeah, but even in the previous ones that I've seen, I've never seen the cargo dragon push to its theoretical maximums that are advertised. Jeff, uh, thank you for the five quid. A question has been asked: Are there any Apollo or other space junk? worth recovering. Yeah, I would say so. Um, there's every evidence to suggest that the vast majority of the stuff that we left behind on the moon is still there um, in a particular book that I'm very fond of. I'm um, not going to mention titles or authors because copyright things, but it actually describes a, a moon base where tourists come to visit on a regular basis to see the original moon landing site um in the you know the sea of tranquility so you know that's uh that's uh you know maybe not bringing the stuff back but taking tourists to the moon in order to see where neil armstrong took those first steps i think that there could be huge money um involved in that and obviously starship is the uh is the practical use for that um so yeah, it's it, it is an interesting you know thing to discuss. A lot of people also talk you know let's use Starship as a moon base. It is the moon base, that sort of thing. You know, I I, I you're right. It could be used for that. My my concern is is it kind of eliminates the the point though. This is a reusable vessel. So the whole idea is Starship is supposed to be used many many times over and can carry huge amounts of cargo over and over again, thus reducing our cost of bringing stuff to orbit and bringing stuff to the moon, etc. If you leave it as a base somewhere, then you're not reusing it anymore. You're it's just, just a base. Um, and it, to me, it kind of defeats the purpose. That's just my own personal opinion. Plus, you also have more than two thirds of Starship that's dedicated to fuel tanks and engines that would no longer be used for that purpose. You'd have to rip all that stuff out and repurpose Starship, the, the two thirds of it that was being used for engines and and fuel tanks and oxidizer tanks, you know, you would need to uh, repurpose that as habitation. Um, it could be done. It could definitely be done that way, but it sounds like a lot of work. Um, and also you'd need to take all of the additional payload required to fill up that starship to make it into a full-fledged moon base. It just sounds a heck, like a heck of a lot of work when you can also take a huge inflatable module, the Bigelow type and Sierra Nevada type modules. You can take a colossal module inside the fairing of Starship and uh, and make a giant moon base um, at the same time. So you know it's it. I'm, I, you know once again, it can definitely be used for for that purpose. 
Um, it could be, it can be, you know, Starship can have a lot of theoretical uses. I just feel that the best use for Starship is to take advantage of reusability. Reusability is the key to Starship success. That's just, you know, my opinion. But once again, somebody else might make use of it for it for a lot of other purposes. So, you know, you never can tell. Never can tell. Thank you, Ian, very much for, for the five quid. Given the size of the Starship, how close do you think we are to a continuous homogenous heat shield rather than the difficulty of installing disparate tiles? Boy, I don't know. Um, right now, uh, they're, they're doing the tile thing and the tiles. Once again, we have no idea. You know, all we're, all, all we're doing is guessing here based on what we saw. But, you know, from what we saw from SN20, they may still have some work to do on that uh, heat shield. Um, a lot of those tiles didn't seem to hold up very well just from being taken out and moving the ship around, letting alone flying it or re-entering the atmosphere. But once again, who knows? Some people have suggested that maybe that was a test of a new type of tile that didn't work out. They're gonna go back to the other tiles that they use for SN15. Once again, a lot of speculation, just lots and lots of speculation when it comes to that. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, the, you know, Mars, Mars is a dream. Mars is never going to be a really profitable thing, at least not for a long time. Mars is, you know, has an idealistic goal, and that is to save the human species, you know, by making us multiplanetary. If and when something cataclysmic happens here, we will still have a presence someplace else. Human beings that can eventually come back to Earth, maybe, or something like that, recolonize it. We will survive as a species if we exist someplace else. It's a great idea, and I think that it absolutely needs to be done. There's just not a lot of money in it, at least not for a while, unless they discover some kind of really valuable rare metals or some other sorts of things that are very important to our technology on Mars that's very hard to find here, and they find it there, then, uh, then Mars might have some money in it. Then people might get really super interested. Um, but we're not at, at that point yet, obviously. So, you know, we, that's, I guess my point is what I'm trying to say is that we need to have, I'm sorry, I'm looking up uh, some questions coming in. We need to have a, a society and a corporate culture that's interested in space on a big scale. We've got to have, you know, the, the corporate system of this planet, uh, the, you know, the financial investors, all that, they need to get behind the whole idea that we're going to space big time, that we are moving lots of people to space and that there is going to be money made, but in the very long term, and it's worth it to invest our money in it. You hear what I'm saying, Jeff Bezos? Stop spending all this money on suing people and instead put money into what you say you're interested in, which is moving human um, manufacturing, especially heavy industry, the damaging and destructive things that are polluting and destroying our planet, etc. You know, let's, I mean, come on, look at the cash that you have. Look at the allies that you have. Look at the other investors who believe in what you say, because after all, Amazon is the probably the most successful company in the history of mankind. Tons of people will get behind you on these ideas if you just invest in it. So start investing in it. Start building your own space station. Start building a huge one with the idea of manufacturing lots of, uh, you know, lots of unique goods and microgravity, that sort of thing. Start working on this. Start doing the things that Axiom Space is doing with a whole lot less cash and start doing it on a big scale. Come on, Jeff, you've got the money. This is supposedly what you believe in. So do it. Do it, damn it. Stop suing people, and, and I'll tell you, you will build a massive legacy for yourself. You will be a big name and a hero in the space industry and, and amongst the space community. If you start doing that instead of suing people, they will love you. I Hell, I'll start making tons of positive videos about Blue Origin if you actually start doing that. But guess what? That's not what's happening. 
and that frustrates the hell out of me. It really does. We need the you know the big money on this planet to be investing in space and space you know the aggressive um, exploitation of space, not just satellites. We need a lot more than that, but unfortunately, it's not happening a great deal. Like I say, with what, what I did with my video recently on Virgin Orbit and the new Virgin Orbit, the whole idea, you know, which I agree with Sir Richard Branson's his idea is the democratization of space to make space available to small countries, to universities, you know. You know organizations that only have a small amount of cash and let them go into space. I love that idea, but that needs to be coupled with a much larger scale exploitation of space. And right now that's not happening at all. Um, it's really not happening to the degree that it needs to. And, uh, and that just needs to stop. Okay. Dante thinks starships might be very big on the large, uh, on the large side. Could potentially be something like a Falcon 9 XL based on a 9 Raptor first stage, an RVAC reusable second stage with SpaceX engine. It's hard to but they probably considered or rejected that. Um, Michael Mars, uh, the larger ship more practical for big equipment. Yeah, that's that's just it. You know, um, big equipment means going to the moon big time, which hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, we still have a ways to go before we're looking at the you know big time large scale exploitation of the uh, of the moon. That is a a big deal to uh, to say the least. Um, now I'll tell you the one counterpoint to my previous point is that with Starship, you can do big, dumb satellites. It can be a metric ton or more, do the same job as a small sat, but a lot cheaper. Interesting point. Interesting point. Didn't uh, didn't really think of that, but that's that's a very interesting idea. Some satellites that do need a massive lift capacity. Yes, that is true, uh, Lord Burkhardt. That is indeed the case. There, there definitely needs to be, um, you know, some satellites definitely require that. The thing of it is, is those satellites seem to be coming fewer and far between. Even like Space Force and the U.S. military seems to be focusing a lot on small sats. And it makes a lot of sense, really, because if you put up a small sat constellation that can provide you with reconnaissance and other information that the military requires, and though, you know, a few of those satellites get taken out by anti-sat weapons, something like you know, Virgin Orbit, your 747s can take off and deploy a whole bunch of replacement satellites in the space of a couple of days. You don't need to prep a launch site. You don't need to, you know, worry about no-go zones, people infringing on your launch area and scrubbing missions. You don't have to worry about weather conditions screwing up your, your launch because all you do is just fly the airplane someplace else and launch it from there. You know, these are the kinds of, of things that people are thinking about right now. And although I like it, I think that doing just that is a big mistake. I think that we need to invest in, in everything. Um, let's see. Okay. Well, for me, as always, it's Starship's main goal is being a crude ship. Yes. Do more. That's great. Long-term is getting people to Mars. Yep. That, that is the long-term goal. That is the big thing for Starship. And I believe in that, but you know, we need to say, you know, is how many other, you know, people are going to get behind this? How many other companies are going to get behind the idea of going to Mars with a permanent settlement aside from SpaceX? You know, it, now SpaceX, you know, through Starlink may have, you know, $50 billion a year or something like that, in which case they can do everything themselves. But until that time comes, they're going to need partners in order to invest in this idea they need to get other people that want to jump on board with this sort of thing. A heavier space station might be a lot cheaper if you may want to have steel rather exotic than exotic materials. Yeah, that's a good point. Lord Michael, um, let's see here. Definitely NASA needs as much cargo capacity as possible to stay on the moon. That's true. Um, you know, to a degree, it all depends. When are they going to start using SLS to take people instead of just cargo? Because, or rather, um, to the, I'm sorry, the Starship to take people instead of cargo. Because right now it's just SLS, and SLS is only scheduled for one launch a year because it's so stinking expensive. And, the, you know, they have that plan for pretty much the rest of the decade is just SLS. When are they going to transition away from SLS, which is crazy expensive, 
you know, when are they going to transition to something better? To, you know, obviously to Starship, it may take some time before they trust Starship to take large numbers of people to the moon. Um, companies may never consider it due to a lack of an adequate rocket, says Andrew. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, with Starship being available, um, companies may say, hey, check it out. We have a new opportunity now. Um, so, by the way, uh, for those, those who have joined me today, thank you very much. Please like, please subscribe. Um, for those of you who have contributed so far to the episode, really definitely appreciate it. Could uh, could very much use everything that's uh, that's been done today. So thank you. And there are other ways to support the channel, obviously, in the description. Okay, enough self promotion there. Um, let's go ahead and uh, check the cost of flight may be cheap as long as the money comes back in through tourism, says Leon. Yep, very true. Very true. Um, if you know, if you can, if if you can find enough tourists who are interested in it and you can make it inexpensive for them, which is very possible with Starship, then yeah, space tourism to the moon and that sort of thing becomes a reality. It becomes something that lots of people may jump on, you know, that go with the uh, opportunity. So yeah, that's uh, that's very interesting uh, indeed. So um, Dante says uh, Starship is a massive payload volume. Yep, that's true. It does have a lot of volume. Um, as opposed to its mass limit. Leon says, um, well, Jeff, the only big shot when it comes to space, so is to leave his ego behind and just do it. Exploration missions into the solar system can be much more rich in science experiments, even without crew. It's true. Let's jump on top of this. Uh, and once again, I mean, yeah, I can talk about Jeff forever. And frankly, as I've said before, I'm getting pretty sick of it. Um, just because I'm tired, tired of, just, I mean, I know I'm the angry astronaut, but I'm sick of getting, being so negative on a company that's supposed to be cutting edge space, that's supposed to be revolutionizing the future of space. They keep saying that they're going to, but that's not the case. Um, Lomax, just thank you very much for the super chat and just asked, what is your opinion about the time SpaceX sued NASA in 2005 over Kistler Aerospace? You know something, Lomax, it's almost the same thing. It's almost the same damn thing, uh, except they won in the GAO dispute, uh, whereas, you know, so would Elon have appealed that to the uh, to the um, federal court of appeals if he had lost with the GAO way back then? It's hard to say, but in those days, two years prior to the uh, launch of Falcon 1, the very first flight of Falcon 1, um, SpaceX sued through the GAO that they weren't given a chance to haul cargo to the ISS because of the Kistler Aerospace contract. And, you know, they didn't have a flight-ready rocket. They wouldn't have a flight-ready rocket for some time because their first three ones blew up even after they flew Falcon 1. So, yeah, um, there is a point to be made that Elon did kind of the same thing. The difference is, of course, in my opinion, is that, you know, of course, this is hindsight, but it all worked. It was all successful. Whereas, you know, the national team's HLS lander, as I've described so many times, is so deeply flawed that we're essentially you know, going to court a million times to try to convince NASA or force NASA to accept an HLS system that simply is not going to be you know, cost effective because it's two thirds non reusable and it's not going to be safe. Plus, it also requires that Blue Origin design a new engine. Um, yeah, they're working on it, but uh, we've seen how good they are at new engines. Um, so I'm not a uh, big thing. Do I think Skylon will ever be a real thing? I'm actually working on a video for Skylon, so I'm going to answer that question um, in the video. So uh, we'll, we'll see how. How that goes. Um, okay, so uh, let's have a, let's see here uh, where no one has sued before. Yes, why don't they take all the space junk found and dump it all over Afghanistan and take out the Taliban? Yeah, that would be any, any way to take out the Taliban. I'm completely in favor of that. Um, and ISIS K, who have decided that uh, the Taliban are not hardcore enough for them. Oh, dear God almighty. Um, how do you take a, a religious philosophy and just replace it with kill the innocent over and over and over again? Because that's all they seem to believe in. Um, I don't get it. I, I try to be as tolerant as possible, but I come on. Um, anyway, this isn't about, you know, Afghanistan, obviously. 
Yeah, yeah. It's um, so like I say, I, I mean, you know, I've never regarded the, the tragedy in Afghanistan as being about politics. It's about people. But nevertheless, it's not about space. So we'll get off that topic. Um, Lewis, thank you very much. Really do appreciate the super chat. Very, very nice of you. Really do appreciate it. Thank you very much for the folks in Australia and for everybody down under the Kiwis as well who may have joined me. Um, God, to join me at this time of night uh, really is very nice of you. And I'm only going to be here for a few more minutes. I hate to say it, but um, number one, my son is here. Number two, I'm, I'm kind of drained. So, um, so yeah, just getting back on the topic, you know, Starship is going to, in order for Starship to be, you know, practical, it's going to need customers. And that is going to be, you know, the big thing. Are they going to have the customer base to support 100 tons to LEO, 100 tons to moon, to the moon, that sort of thing. Um, it's 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 very interesting. And, you know, I certainly hope so. That's what I want to see happen. I want to see, you know, heavy industry and, you know, and habitation and, you know, everything associated with human civilization go to space. And that can't happen without a lot of cargo capacity. So, you know, Starship is the solution to that. But, you know, the question is, do we have enough people who are interested, enough people who are going to invest in it, that sort of thing? Um, Let's see here. Earth point to point will have the opportunity to change travel. Yes, that is another thing that's, you know, hotly debated is if Earth point to point becomes a thing, then Starship becomes a thing. No question. If if Earth point to point is proven to be cost effective and safe, that's the big thing. Safe. Um, that is that is a, uh, you know, a big thing. Um, I don't know, frankly, we've never tried anything remotely like that, um, flying that many people from one place on the earth to another um, with such a massive rocket, you know, is that doable? Maybe. Um, SpaceX certainly seems to think so. Um, I think it's going to take a lot of experimentation and a lot of proof proving, you know, they're going to have to really make a point before they start taking lots of commercial passengers from one place to another on this planet um, you know, before the FAA permits that. Um, so that's going to be a, uh, a big case indeed. Um, and yeah, that is true, Johnny. Good point made. Kistler didn't fly. The problem was at the time, it seemed that they were going to. They were 75% funded. They had a good, you know, they had a, a seen what seemed to be a very good plan. You know, at the time, everything looked good with Kistler. And then they got the rug pulled out from underneath them. And so, you know, if you were a fan of Kistler at the time, if you were an employee of Kistler, if you were an investor of Kistler, you probably got really angry over that whole situation, you know, over, over Kistler losing that contract. But in retrospect, it was the right choice, wasn't it? Because, you know, SpaceX obviously had a solution that worked better than anybody else's solution. And that, of course, includes today Falcon 9 plus the Dragon, both in terms of cargo and crew, is the best solution for the ISS. Um, I do believe that Dream Chaser is going to give it a run for its money, um, but Dream Chaser isn't ready yet. Um, so that is all very interesting. But yeah, Earth, uh, to get back on the point to point thing, um, one you know drawback with point to point is it requires a lot more fuel. Um, to, you know, the amount of fuel used to get Starship from one point to another on this planet versus the amount of fuel it requires for an airliner to do the same thing is colossal. I mean, we're talking 100 to 1 or something or 50 to 1. It's a massive ratio in terms of the amount of, of fuel it requires to get a really heavy rocket up to suborbital space and back down safely versus an airliner. Um, is that something that's going to you know, be regarded as practical? How expensive is it going to be for these passengers? That sort of thing. Um, you know, and are they ever going to regard it as being safe? I think that it, it is doable. I just think it's going to take some time before, you know, the powers that be, the people who are going, you know, the FAA and others who are going to be able to green light something like this are going to say, yeah, okay, it's safe, let's go. Um, 
So yeah, it's uh, that is the case, and yeah, that that is the thing. Reusability, um, you know, I'm a big believer in it. Obviously, I uh, have been since I started this channel. Uh, I really believe that you know reusability is the future. Um, and you know, that's another thing I put in my recent video about Virgin Orbit. Um, they're not just reusing the 747. That their plan is to also reuse the first stage of Launcher One. Um, you know, that's going to be a parafoil recovery system. So that tiny little rocket, the tiny little second stage or maybe third stage of Launcher One is going to be the only expendable part of Virgin Orbit, which is going to make it really inexpensive at that point um, for small sat. Um, okay, uh, David, thank you. Do, do you think the future of the Starship is to move gear for the U.S. military is likely. You know something, David? The U.S. military seems to think so. They're very interested in that concept. And uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I think it's a very interesting idea. Obviously, you're not putting human lives at risk at, as much. Um, so, and the military obviously has tons of money to spend. Um, so yeah, if they jump on to that um, concept, if they, if the military thinks that that's a good idea, then that is a huge monumental customer for Starship. Um, that will change everything for Starship, and and it is a, a very good idea, very good idea to you. Lord Burkhardt says, I wonder if massive Mylar or similar mirrors uh, would be feasible with Starship. Use orbital systems to keep solar power plants. Yeah, that is another thing I, I forgot to mention. Another huge use of Starship is the deployment of massive orbital solar arrays. That is a uh, huge use for Starship. You know, it, for, for solar arrays to be practical, they have to be big, very big, in order to provide the necessary energy to power a city like New York. And the only way you're going to put up a huge um, array like that is with something with a lot of cargo capacity. So Starship would be perfect for that. Johnny Spacer, thank you very much for the super chat. Really do appreciate it. Only have about three minutes left, guys. Boy, time flies. It really does. Um, let's see here. Starship itself can be used as a station. Multiple starships would be able to extend in orbit research. Interesting. I didn't, I'm sorry. I did. Yeah. Uh, multiple starships would be able to extend in orbit research and medical usage, for example, organ printing, that sort of thing. Yeah, you're right, Leon. Um, the interesting thing is that's what Axiom is doing right now. Um, you know, their private space station is designed to do that in particular. What's going to be interesting is does Axiom prove that this is um, viable? Do they prove that it's profitable? If they do, they're going to have some huge investors um, and could get a lot more cash than they currently do. If they get a lot more investment, then they can build much bigger space stations and those will need to be deployed by something like Starship. Um, so yeah, that's a uh, that's an interesting thing indeed. Um, and uh, I'm all for it. Believe me, I want all of this to happen. I want Starship to be practical. This, like I said, the purpose of this was to, you know, to brainstorm it. Let's listen to some ideas about all that, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's intriguing. It's, it's very intriguing. Um, and I, I certainly hope that, uh, that more companies begin to embrace this concept. I have spoken extensively, uh, to the folks at Axiom, by the way, I know I keep bringing them up, but obviously they are supporters of this channel. Um, they also are donating uh, their own swag to the sweepstakes, by the way. I didn't mention that. The sweepstakes still going on. The link is in the description for not only a lot of my merch, but some Axiom merch as well. But they don't believe in just a small little space station to replace ISS. They're behind the concept of artificial gravity eventually, big rotating space stations, that sort of thing. They just don't want to go after it right now because the amount of money required to build something like that would be colossal. Um, and But that's what they're going after eventually. And they have some very aggressive ambitions. Um, pardon me? Okay, so in any event, let me go ahead and conclude because we're almost at the end here and I'm just going to go ahead and make one more statement. So what I'm trying to say here is that right now Starship doesn't have the interest in the commercial in, you know, world 
for it to be practical yet. I mean, sure, SpaceX has a lot of uses for it. Maybe NASA has a few uses for it, but the world in general doesn't have a use for it because they don't believe in it. I mean, come on, let's face it. The vast majority of people who watch YouTube, who you know are online on social media and all that, they don't believe in this stuff. They don't even know anything about this stuff. And that includes people who have tons of money to invest. And that's why we have the problem that I was discussing today. That's why we don't have practical uses for Starship yet. We have some, but not enough. We need more. We need more practical uses, which means we need more people with money, with the ability to invest to get behind this. And that absolutely needs to change. It absolutely needs to happen, not only for the sake of space and starship and all that, but for the future of humanity. We need to expand out into the solar system to go out of the cradle where our species was born and expand out into the rest of the cosmos as we were destined to do. And really quick, Ryan, thank you very much for your support. It allows me to stay angry on this channel for a long time time to come. So until the the corporate world and the commercial world and indeed the average person starts to think that space is worth it, that investing in space is worth it until this actually happens, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.